Section 7 of Essays on Art. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Essays on Art by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Samuel Gray Ward. Section 7. Upon the Laocoon a true work of art like a work of nature never ceases to open boundlessly before the mind we examine we are impressed with it it produces its effect but it can never be all comprehended still less can its essence its value be expressed in words in the present remarks concerning the lao kuan our object is by no means to say all that can be said on the subject we shall rather make this admirable work the occasion than the subject of what we have to say may it soon be placed once more in a situation where all lovers of art may be able to enjoy and speak of it each in his own way we can hardly speak adequately of a high work of art without also speaking of art in general since all art is comprehended in it and each one is able according to his powers to develop the universal out of such a special case we will therefore preface with some remarks of a general nature all high works of art are expressions of humanity plastic art relates particularly to the human form it is of this we are now speaking art has many steps in all of which there have been admirable artists but a perfect work of art embraces all the particulars that are elsewhere encountered separately the highest works of art that we know exhibit to us living highly organized natures we look in the first place for a knowledge of the human body in its parts and masses inward and outward adaptation its forms and motions generally character knowledge of the varieties in form and action of their parts peculiarities are discriminated and separately set forth out of this results character through which an important relation may be established among separate works and in like manner when a work is put together its parts may hold an analogous relation to each other the subject may be at rest or in motion a work or its parts may either be self-centered simply showing its character in a state of rest or it may be exhibited in movement activity or fullness of passionate expression ideal to the attainment of this the artist needs a deep well-grounded steadfast mind which must be accompanied by a higher sense in order to comprehend the subject in all its bearings to find the moment of expression to withdraw this from the narrowness of fact and give to it in an ideal world proportion limit reality and dignity agreeableness the subject and its mode of exhibition are moreover connected with the sensible laws of art viz harmony comprehensibility symmetry contrast etc whereby it becomes visibly beautiful or agreeable as it is called beauty farther we find that it obeys the laws of spiritual beauty which arises from just proportion and to which he who is complete in the creation or production of the beautiful knows how to subject even the extremes having now announced the conditions which we demand of a high work of art much will be comprised in a few words when i say that our group fulfills them all nay that out of them alone could it be developed it will be conceded by all that it exhibits acquaintance with the human form and with what is characteristic in it and at the same time expression and passion in how high and ideal a way the subject is treated will presently be shown 
and no one who recognizes the harmony with which the extremes of bodily and mental suffering are set forth can hesitate about calling the work beautiful on the other hand many will think i am uttering a paradox when i maintain that the work is also agreeable a word upon this point every work of art must show on the face of it that it is such and this can be done only through what we call sensible beauty or agreeableness the ancients far from entertaining the modern notion that a work of art must have the appearance of a work of nature designated their works of art as such through an intentional arrangement of parts by means of symmetry they rendered easy for the eye an insight into relations and thus a complicated work was made comprehensible through symmetry and opposition slight deviations were made productive of the sharpest contrasts the pains of the artist were most happily bestowed to place the masses in opposition to each other and particularly in groups to bring the extremities of the bodies against each other in a harmonious position so that every work when we disregard its import and look only at its general outline from a distance strikes the eye by its ornamental air the antique vases furnish a hundred instances of this sort of agreeable composition and perhaps it would be possible to exhibit a series of examples of symmetrically artistic and eye-filling groupings from the most quiet vase sculptures up to the lao kaon i shall therefore venture to repeat the assertion that the group of lao kaon in addition to its other acknowledged merits is at once a model of symmetry and variety of repose and action of contrast and gradation which produce an impression partly sensible partly spiritual agreeably stimulate the imagination by the high pathos of the representation and by their grace and beauty temper the storm of passion and suffering it is a great advantage for a work of art to be self-included and complete an object at rest exhibiting simple being is thus complete by and in itself a jupiter the thunderbolt resting in his lap a juno reposing on her majesty and feminine dignity a minerva inwardly intent are all subjects that have no impulse outwards that rest upon and in themselves the first the most lovely subjects of sculpture but within the noble round of the mythic circle of art where these separate self-existent natures stand and rest there are smaller circles which in which the figures are conceived and wrought out with reference to other figures for example the nine muses with their leader apollo are each one conceived and executed separately but they become far more interesting in their complete and diversified choir when art attempts scenes of exalted expression it can treat them also in the same manner it may either present to us a circle of figures holding a passionate relation to each other like the niobe and her children pursued by apollo and diana or exhibit in the same piece the action and the motive we have now in mind such groups as the graceful boy extracting the thorn from his foot the wrestler two groups of fauns and nymphs in dresden and the noble and passionate group of Leaquan. sculpture is justly entitled to the high rank it holds because it can and must carry expression to its highest point of perfection from the fact that it leaves man only the absolutely essential thus in the present group Leaquan is a bare name the artists have stripped him of his priesthood his trojan nationality of every poetical or mythological attribute there remains nothing of all that fable had clothed him with he is a father with his two sons in danger of destruction from two fierce animals 
in like manner we see no messenger of the gods but two plain natural serpents powerful enough to overcome a man but by no means either in form or treatment supernatural and avenging ministers of wrath they glide in as it is their nature to do twine around not together and one being irritated bites if i had to describe this work without knowing the farther intent of it i should say it were a tragic idol a father was sleeping with his two sons beside him two serpents twined about them and now waking they struggle to free themselves from the living net the expression of the moment is in this work of the highest importance when it is intended that a work of art shall move before the eye a passing moment must of course be chosen but a moment ago not a single part of the whole was to be found in the position it now holds and in another instant all will be changed again so that it presents a fresh living image to a million beholders in order to conceive rightly the intention of the laocoon let a man place himself before it at a proper distance with his eyes shut then let him open his eyes and shut them again instantly by this means he will see the whole marble in motion he will fear lest he find the whole group changed when he opens his eyes again it might be said that as it stands it is a flash of lightning fixed a wave petrified in the moment it rushes towards the shore the same effect is produced by the contemplation of the group by torchlight the situation of the three figures are represented with a wise gradation in the oldest son only the extremities are entangled the second is encumbered with more folds and especially by the knot around his breast he endeavors to get breath by the motion of his right arm with the left hand he gently holds back the serpent's head to prevent him from taking another turn round his breast the serpent is in the act of slipping under the hand but does not bite the father on the other hand tries to set himself and the children free by force he grasps the other serpent which exasperated bites him in the hip the best way to understand the position of the father both in the whole and in detail seems to me to be to take the sudden anguish of the wound as the moving cause of the whole action the serpent has not bitten but is just now biting and in a sensitive part above and just behind the hip the position of the restored head of the serpent does not represent the bite correctly fortunately the remains of the two jaws may yet be seen on the hinder part of the statue if indeed these important vestiges have not been removed in the course of the present poultry alterations the serpent inflicts a wound upon the unhappy man in a part where we are exceedingly sensible to any irritation where even a little tickling is able to produce the action which in this case is caused by the wound the figure starts away towards the opposite side the body is drawn in the shoulder forced down the breast thrust out the head sinks towards the wounded side the secondary portion of the situation or treatment appears in the imprisoned feet and the struggling arms and thus from the contrast of struggle and flight of action and suffering of energy and failing strength results an harmonious action that would perhaps be impossible under other conditions we are lost in astonishment at the sagacity of the artist if we try to place the bite in some different position the whole action is changed and we find it impossible to conceive one more fitting it is moreover important to remark that as the artist exhibits a sensible effect he also gives a sensible cause i repeat it the situation of the bite renders necessary the present action of the limbs the movement of the lower part of the figure as if to fly the drawing in of the body the downward action of the shoulders and the head the breast forced out 
nay, the expression of each feature of the face, all determined by this instant, sharp, unlooked-for irritation. Far be it from me to destroy the unity of human nature, to deny the sympathetic action of the spiritual powers of this nobly complete man, to misconceive the action and suffering of a great nature, i see also anguish fear horror a father's anxiety pervading these veins swelling this breast furrowing this brow i freely admit that the highest state of mental as well as bodily anguish is here represented only let us not transfer the effect the work produces on us too hastily to the piece itself and above all let us not be looking for the effect of poison in a body which the serpent's fang has but just reached let us not fancy we see a death struggle in a noble resisting uninjured or but slightly wounded frame here let me have leave to make an observation of importance in art the highest pathetic expression that can be given by art hovers in the transition from one state or condition to another you see a lively child running with all the energy and joy of life bounding and full of delight he is unexpectedly struck somewhat roughly by a playmate or is otherwise morally or physically hurt and this new sensation thrills like an electric shock through all his limbs this transition is in the highest degree pathetic it is a revulsion of which one can form no idea without having seen it in this case plainly the spiritual as well as the physical man is in action if during the transition there still remain evident traces of the previous state the result is the noblest subject for plastic art as is the case in the Leakwan, where action and suffering are shown in the same instant thus for instance eurydice bitten in the heel by the snake she has trodden on as she goes joyfully through the meadow and the flowers she has collected would make a most pathetic statue because the twofold state the joyful advance and its painful arrest might be expressed not only by the flowers that she lets fall but by the direction of her limbs and the doubtful fluttering of her dress having now a clear conception in this respect of the main figure we shall be enabled to give a free and secure glance over the relations contrasts and gradations of the collective parts of the whole the choice of subject is one of the happiest that can be imagined men struggling with dangerous animals and animals that do not act as a mass or concentrated force but with divided powers that do not rush in at one side nor offer a combined resistance but capable by their prolonged organization of paralyzing without injuring them three men or more or less from the action of this numbing force results consistently with the most violent action a pervading unity and repose throughout the whole the different action of the serpents is exhibited in gradation the one is simply twined around its victims the other becomes irritated and bites its antagonist the three figures are in like manner most wisely selected a strong well-developed man but evidently past the age of greatest energy and therefore less able to endure pain and suffering substitute in his place a robust young man and the charm of the group vanishes joined with him in his suffering are two boys small in proportion to his figure but still two natures susceptible of pain the struggles of the youngest are powerless he is tortured but uninjured the father struggles powerfully but ineffectually his efforts have rather the effect to exasperate the opposed force his opponent becoming irritated wounds him the eldest son is least encumbered he suffers neither pressure nor pain he is terrified by the sudden wounding of his father and his movement thereupon 
he cries out, at the same moment endeavouring to free his foot from the serpent's fold. Here then is spectator, witness, and accessory to the fact, and thus the work is completed. Let me here repeat what I alluded to above, viz. that all three figures exhibit a twofold treatment, and thus the greatest variety of interests is produced. The youngest son strives to get breath by raising his right arm, and with his left hand keeps back the serpent's head. He is striving to alleviate the present and avert the appending evil, the highest degree of action he can attain in his present imprisoned condition. The father is striving to shake off the serpent, while he endeavors instinctively to fly from the bite. The oldest son is terrified by his father's starting, and seeks at the same time to free himself from the lightly twined serpent. The choice of the highest moment of expression has been already spoken of as a great advantage possessed by the work, into which consideration let us enter more deeply. We suppose the case that mere natural serpents have twined about a father sleeping by his sons, in order that, by consideration of separate moments, we may have a succession of interest before us. The first moments of the serpents winding about them are portentous, but not adapted to art. We might perhaps imagine an infant Hercules asleep with a serpent twined about him, but in this case the form in repose would show us what we were to expect when he waked. Let us now proceed and figure to ourselves a father with his children when first let it have happened how it may he discovers the serpents wound about him we have now a moment of the highest interest one of the figures paralyzed by the pressure the second paralyzed and wounded too the third still retaining the hope of escape in the first condition is the younger son in the second the father in the third the eldest son seek now to find another equal moment try to change the order of the dramatis personae. If we consider now the treatment from the beginning, we must acknowledge that it has reached the highest point, and in like manner, if we reflect upon the succeeding moments, we shall perceive that the whole group must necessarily be changed, and that no moment can be found equal to this in artistic significance the youngest son will either be suffocated by the pressure of the serpent or should he in his helpless condition exasperate it he must be bitten neither alternative could we endure since they suppose an extremity unsuitable for representation as to the father he would either be bitten by the serpent in other places whereby the position of the body would be entirely changed and the previous wounds would either be lost to the beholder or if made evident would be loathsome or the serpent might turn about and assail the eldest son whose attention would then be turned to himself the scene loses its participators the last glimpse of hope disappears from the group the situation is no longer tragical it becomes fearful. The figure of the father, which is now self-centered in its greatness and its suffering, would in that case be turned towards the son and become a sympathizing subordinate. Man has, for his own and other sufferings, only three sorts of sensations, apprehension, terror, and compassion. The anxious foreseeing of an approaching evil the unexpected realization of present pain, and sympathy with existing or past suffering. All three are excited by and exhibited in the present work, and in the truest gradation. Plastic art, laboring always for a single point of time in choosing a pathetic subject, seizes one that awakens terror, while on the other hand poetry prefers such as excite apprehension and compassion in the group of leaquan the suffering of the father awakens terror 
and that in the highest degree sculpture has done her utmost for him but partly to run through the circle of human sensations partly to soften the effect of so much of the terrible it excites pity for the younger son and apprehension for the elder through the hope that still exists for him thus by means of variety the artists have introduced a certain balance into their work have softened and heightened action by other action and completed at once a spiritual and sensible whole in a word we dare strongly affirm that this work exhausts its subject and happily fulfils all the conditions of art it teaches us that if the master can infuse his feeling of beauty into reposing and simple subjects the same can also be exhibited in the highest energy and worth when it manifests itself in the creation of varied character and knows how by artistic imitation to temper and control the passionate outbreak of human feeling we shall give in the sequel a full account of the statues known by the name of the family of niobe as well as the group of the farnesian bull they belong to the few pathetic representations that remain to us out of the antique sculptures it has been the usual fate of the moderns to blunder in their choice of subjects of this sort when milo with both his hands fast in the cleft of a tree is attacked by a lion art in vain endeavours to create a work that will excite a sincere sympathy a twofold suffering a fruitless struggle a helpless state a certain defeat can only excite horror if they do not leave us cold finally a word concerning this subject in its connection with poetry it is doing virgil and the poetic art a great injustice to compare even for a moment this completest achievement of sculpture with the episodical treatment of the subject in the aeneid as soon as the unhappy wanderer aeneas has to account how he and his fellow-citizens were guilty of the unpardonable folly of bringing the famous horse into their city the poet must hit upon some way to provide a motive for this treatment this is the origin of the whole and the story of the aquan stands here as a rhetorical argument to justify an exaggeration which is essential to the design two monstrous serpents are brought out of the sea with crested heads they rush upon the children of the priest who had injured the horse encircle them bite them slaver them twist and twine about the breast and head of the father as he hastens to their assistance and hold up their heads high in triumph while the victims enclosed in their folds scream in vain for help the people are horror-struck and fly at once no one dares to be a patriot longer and the hearer satiated with the horror of the strange and dreadful story is willing to let the horse be brought into the city thus in virgil the story of the Laquan serves only as a step to a higher aim and it is a great question whether the occurrence be in itself a poetic subject end of section seven